Right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to special edition of Deep Dives with the Fed. Uh, today we're doing Chainlink of all companies. Um, as you can tell, so we have a Don who you guys probably recognize from Witnet. <laughs> also, Tomas, who's also from Witnet. And you, you might ask yourself, that's not Chainlink, which is true. Uh, so this is similar to the Uniswap one that we did. Um, the people for over at Chainlink, we messaged a whole bunch of them. Uh, some of them did respond and said they'll get back to us, but they never actually got back to us. So they didn't want to be on my podcast for various reasons. Anyway, so we're going to just do it on our own. We thought it would um, be just better to get the information out there. Obviously, if anything is wrong, <laughs> uh, feel free to correct us we'll be happy to correct the videos um we're not speaking as if we work at Chainlink or have ever worked at Chainlink we just um I don't know how you guys did research I I um we're obviously very familiar with how they work but I, I want to we, we kind of want to focus more here on how do they actually work currently um how are people using them um and then and then we can kind of go from there so sound good uh, Very good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. From from a basic perspective, though, you know, like maybe, I know you guys are, are sort of OGs in the Oracle space. Like, how did Chainlink come about? What was, you know, do you remember like when they when was the first time you guys heard of Chainlink? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, you know, um, Chainlink they they published their white paper during um, like amidst the ICO craze of twenty seventeen. Um, and we already know, the, we already knew these guys from, uh, smartcontracts.com. They had been around for, uh, quite a while. Um, uh, and that, at the time we were working in this project called Stampery, which was like a timestamping service based on public blockchains. And we had been in contact with, with them because they were interested in this technology and they were doing sort of, uh, similar stuff. And, um, and yeah, and, and it, it really made sense, uh, for us that they started working on this. We read the white paper that, uh, looked very interesting, uh, to us. And it was somehow similar to what we had, uh, started working because at that time we were already working on the white paper for WITNET, which is a different proposal for a decentralized, uh, Oracle. And, um, but there, there were significant differences that made us think that it was totally worth to, um, to build our thing as well. Uh, but all, all through the, uh, this time we have been in, in touch with them and trying to understand what they're up to and, um, so far so good. Cool. Um, yeah. Did they raise any money? Do you know? Uh, yeah, they, they ran this uh, ICO uh, back or then. Was, the um, ICO? Was, there, was there like a big VC round too before that? Or? Uh, that that I don't really know. Um, if, if there was, that, that was uh, private. And um, that the ICO, I think they did like close to 30 million, something like that. Yep. Uh, it was one, one, of the, one of the big ones. Uh, they really did uh, great. Yeah. Um, cool. So I guess we can get started into, I guess, just how they work. So do you guys, I, I know they have like, they have a giant suite of products as far as Chainlink goes, or it would seem that way, but you know, like what I guess are the main ones and which ones can we, we sort of just actually go over, um, or, or would it make sense to go over? Well, yeah, first, uh, before I start, I think it's, it's important to, to remark that uh, Chainlink is, uh, as, as it's a really big product or product of products, right? it's like, like a brand and it has a lot of different things in, inside. Uh, it's really important to remark that most probably uh, there are like different kinds of Chainlinks. The first kind of Chainlink could be the one that is uh, on paper. It's on the different white papers. It's on... Uh, all the things that they have published. The second chain link could be the chain link that is in the, all the people that is using chain link has a different idea of what is chain link. And the third idea, it could be what really is chain link. Uh, 
So it could be uh, really important to take in, into account that the things that we are going to say here are the things related on uh, what is chaining uh, based on the things that you can get when you are using chaining. And I think the most important one or the one that they are uh, promoting the most are the different price fits that they have. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be, I think that'll probably be a good starting point. We can just go over how their price feeds work. Um, so this is for those that we'll, we'll probably post these in, in the video chat. So I think what's the, their biggest one is probably what ETUSD, I think, is, is the main. Yeah. Probably the most used. Um, yeah, most probably. Probably the most used price feed by far would be my guess. I know we we actually did. We have like a dude analytics board up. You guys can see we 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 look at who who their customers are and like when they're what they're actually reading and and I think it's almost the vast majority of it is as you could guess. Okay, so if we're talking about Chainlink, this is so the main contract. I guess this would be um, their ETUSD price feed. We'll we'll just we'll use this one for. Um, for reference for what we're looking at, right? Price feed. And there's this contract here. This is, I think it's called what the EAC aggregator proxy or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so something like that. So if you're wondering, if you want to follow along in the code, um, you can do that. So what is this? This is the contract that I guess if there's a user, so this will be the user who's over here. This will be what Ave compound liquidity. I, I think they use they use these guys and, and they would they would read this contract, right? Mm -hmm. So first off, does the user do we know does the user have to pay? <laughs> that's a, that's a good one. Of course, and uh, the concept itself of um price feeds. Is just a contract from which you can read uh, an updated data point. So um, this this is obviously a constraint of smart contracts. You cannot charge for reading from the state of a contract as long as it, as long as it provides methods for uh, reading from its internal state. Um, so any this this doesn't only apply to Chainlink. This if right. you are operating any Oracle or operating price feeds as we do, um, we are exposed to this con uh, construct. Let's say you need to allow reading from the from the price feeds for free, and then you need to figure out the way to monetize that if you want to monetize that uh, through some other through some other mechanism mechanism either payment channels or or something really brick and mortar like invoicing <laughs> you know, or something like that. Um, so the users, for, um, the users of the price feeds in Chainlink, as far as we know, um, they don't pay directly for for re receiving those updates. But they, uh, some of them are sponsoring those contracts, so essentially paying off chain uh, most times for uh, those uh, contracts to be updated timely for fulfilling, a, let's say, a SLA, a service level agreement. Well, I know they have. So, like, there is this check access function in there. I don't know if you guys saw that one. Like, so you do have to be whitelisted to read, right? Like, in well, some of their interfaces, but, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and like in the original design, uh, it wasn't like that. But most recently, we have seen a shift uh, from their side towards that both on the uh, price feeds and on the randomness generator as well, yeah. which you need to like to create a subscription and you need to, every time you need, you want to query a random number, you need to identify your contract through that, uh, like user or consumer identifier. Yeah. 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 I mean, I saw this one in the E2SD feed too. I, I don't mm -hmm. know who does it, but obviously. So the idea, the idea though, is that there would be, so I think the idea that they would want to say would be that the user is paying for something and then that, that's how you would get access. Yeah. So as of now in the smart contracts, uh, the, it, you could probably bypass this and for the most part, um, even, even if there is a check access, this is 
this is controlled by the multi-sig, right? So mm -hmm. this would be, I, I think that'll be, we can sort of go here now. And so there's a, when we say the multi-sig and chain link, what, what is it? Is it a, it's a five by nine gnosis, I think. Uh, so they, they have, the team multi sig up here. So I, I was doing some, some look in here because Chris Black, I don't know if you guys seen him, but he, he harps on this. So it's a it's a five of nine, but I think it's like um no, it's a four of nine, I believe. And then uh of the nine addresses, only six have been active like in the past year. So <laughs> so it's it's more like a four of six multi sig. Um with three rando keys. And then basically they're the people that get to add to the whitelist. So it's not like go pay and then you can get access. It's like, you gotta go talk to them. So, okay. So the user can basically just read the price feeds are going to update, um, which I guess would come to the next question is how do the price feeds get updated? So, um, as far as we know, uh, there are uh, two situations in which a price feed can update. One is um, every time, like there, there's, there are these uh, deviation threshold, essentially. So uh, every price feed is uh, published with some uh, expectation of deviation threshold, as meaning that if, if the deviation threshold is 1%, for example, uh, the price feed will be updated. There will be a transaction updating the or a set of transactions updating the state of the contract um, with the new price every time that the price, uh, like the market price, the spot price, differs from what's in the contract currently by more than 1%. That's one of the um, the triggers, let's say, for an update. And the other one is uh, what they call the heartbeat, which is essentially a timeout, let's say. So yeah, even if an asset, like if, even if a contract set, uh, tracking the price of an asset um, doesn't update because the asset is quite stable and the deviation threshold hasn't been hit, uh, it will be updated timely uh, every 24 hours, every hour, whatever, uh, they want to set um, just to, to prove that the contract is alive and that everything is is working. This is something that we are also have, and when we and when we try to explain this to our users, I don't know why they are obsessed about the heartbeat. And and I try to explain to them that that's that's bullshit. <laughs> that's that's useless because um, yeah, you, what, what really matters is the deviation that. threshold. That's what speaks about the quality of the price feed and about how much you will accept uh, of a deviation of, a, of, of the price being off uh, from what's in the market, because that percentage uh, will define how much, uh, how people can leverage that um, that contract not being up to date. Yeah. Yeah, completely. I, I don't get people's obsession with heartbeats either in, <laughs> in the Oracle space, but uh, like, I mean, it's like a liveness check, I know, but like, exactly. Especially for people who use Chainlink, it's like if Chainlink goes down, you're screwed anyway with how you implemented your contract. So, like, what? <laughs> um, I don't get it. Anyway, so we have, uh, so this is when it's updated. Do you know is this is this actually enforced in any way in the smart contract? Because like I don't think it is. I think it's almost positive. It's not. A, it's basically just like this is when the nodes usually up. I don't think so. I don't think so. And, and if I was implementing Chainlink, I wouldn't even um, enforce that. That doesn't make sense because it's okay if a contract can be updated um, cool. as, as as often as, as possible. There's there's no point in, in delaying an update. Uh, so that's like, like that deviation threshold is computed off chain and that will trigger the update, but there's nothing in the contract that will prevent it from being updated uh, sooner. But I mean, so this this is another thing. So how how they do the reporting is is they have a list of nodes, right? So how do they what do they call them? Reporters, nodes, or um, something? Node operators. Node operators. Thank you. Go. Um, and these guys, these guys basically all sign prices, correct? Mm -hmm. And then so so they sign prices, 
and then they they aggregate them all into like some what, what do they call the the signature bundle or, or threshold signatures right um and then they, they they put all of their signatures on chain at once right uh -huh. Yeah. So, in, yeah, in its simplest in its simplest form and in the original implementation, it was not even like like yep. that. It, they didn't use any threshold signatures or not even signatures. It was just um, these node operators calling a certain method on the contract, and the contract would wait for their for those transactions. And once there was enough reports, let's say uh, the last report, the, the last reporter would pay the gas for actually computing the median and um, finalizing that round and a new round would start. Yeah, I, I think now in the code, so I was going through the code, like now they have these, these guys in the code at least are called signers. And mm -hmm. then they have another set of people who are called transmitters. And yep. uh, so these guys are allowed to sign the prices and these guys are allowed to grab the sign prices and put it on chain. Yeah, right now, I'm not sure what they are using because I know that uh, a few months ago or last year, they published a, a new white paper, paper talking about the those of chain uh, reporting mechanism. So I'm not sure if they are already using that, if not, or because it, it's really opaque. So we cannot know. Uh, well, this is what, I think this is in the code now that they're, at least on the USD feed. Um, but then, then I noticed too, like um, the other thing, you know, we were talking about, like the users have to pay. Um, I was wondering, do these guys get paid? <laughs> um, and, and like, I mean, what what I guess is the is the line, you know, like theoretically, what what are they getting paid, and how often? Do you guys know? That's 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 a bit complicated uh, and a bit uh, difficult to figure out. In like in the main version of Chainlink that has been live for most of the time, and they didn't get pay or paid or slashed immediately. There was no such mechanism in the in the price feed, the smart smart contract. Uh, that's something that they would like they would get paid often. I don't know. We don't really, we don't really know. Sure. I know for certain that they are working on on mechanisms to to simplify that. And in the last version, I don't really know how they how they approach that in the in terms of um, paying the those rewards. In terms of slashing, there's no slashing in place. So, yeah, yeah. Like I, I noticed. So when I when I was looking at the code, they they do they reimburse gas, which is weird. So like with each. On the whenever they they push this over, they 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 do reimburse this guy with gas in link tokens, which is slightly interesting that they would have to they would have that part hard coded in. But then there's there's no other payments that are hard coded in, and then and then you're right there there's no once the data is on chain it's there. It's not like I don't think there 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 is no possible way to remove it right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I think there is a possible way to remove it in in. Just you'd have to like upgrade the whole contract, <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah. So like th this guy is it's um it's as we said it's a proxy. So this is an upgradable contract of, of four of nine controls. So they, they can change any of these rules at any point. Um. But yeah. Okay. So it, that's that's kind of about how they work. Um. I guess what would be sort of of note, you know, like right now. I know a lot of times they talk about like these are staked people, but is how much are they staked? Do we know? Right now that there, there is no on-chain staking in place. It's something that okay. they are uh, now they recently announced version um, 0 0.1 of the staking mechanism. Okay. It's something that they're working on, but it's not something that they will release anytime soon, anytime and uh, anyway, and it will be uh, the first release from what we have read um, and heard from them, it will be a closed beta. Uh, so um, right now there's no, there's nothing at stake, nothing that, that they can trigger a slashing on. And as a matter of fact, um, the big, the, the time in which some node operator uh, fucked up the most 
uh, there was no 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 immediate slashing and 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 actually the chain link company covered for <laughs> for the um, for the lost fans and whatever and uh, yeah what they are putting into a stake is just their off chain reputation let's say uh, if if some node operator is not reliable they will be uh, the assumption is that users will um, stop relaying on them and that they will get removed from other price feeds but all of that is after the fact and after the damage is done of course um, so that's why in their uh, chilling 2.0 design they're trying to implement a staking mechanism even if yeah. um, I'm not very uh, confident on how they plan to implement it or or their proposal um they obviously their main point of um, work right now is is uh, that one because it's the the biggest like that the, the biggest missing part in their in their mechanism well I mean you have yeah so you know like, like you could get these guys to stake and then you would have to have some way of slashing them and, and that would be be good but right now like even if even if you did have requirements of staking like the right now the whoever who gets to say who these guys and these guys are is just the multi-sig right there's literally no other there's no no check beyond that right now in the code absolutely um so it would be yeah, yeah also something that uh, came to our minds when we were reading about the staking mechanism in, in chilling is that there will be two different kinds of staking mechanism, one for everybody. Uh, every uh, a link holder will be able to stake the link, I, and we don't know what that is going to be. And this is the thing that they are implementing right now in, in the first iteration. And then there will be an uh, proper staking for the node operators. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, in the next version that they are going to release or the, the version that they have announced, they are not going to have a proper slashing mechanism because it, it's only going to be useful for metrics, for logging, and to see if it could work. It's not something that is going to be that is going to be real. It's just to, to monitor the network and to see if it works or not. Yep. Yeah. So what and like what's the purpose? Do do they have the purpose of the the normal participant staking it's like it would just be like link holders in general um, what would they say is the purpose or we don't know I don't we, don't know. Really, we don't really know because the um, um as they are framing it let's say um when when a regular link holder stakes it stakes on uh, like it's like delegation let's say uh, so it's like a, um, yeah, it's, it's a staking game, uh, and there are some coordination games as well there on staking for the node operators that that will give them the most rewards because, in theory, the rewards that go to the node operator are shared among the delegator the delegators. Yeah, so it's a it's a bit. Now well, let's see. Let's say how that plays out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe you it's could, interesting anyway. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, maybe you could make a case for like, it, it, like just even general staking without much work in general. Like, I always wondered like the use case around that. Like, you could say it's either like you have some sort of like modern monetary theory based. Like we had the treasury systems where like you pay people to lock up, so hopefully you get some sort of price stability in in the token at a very high valuation. And, Exactly, exactly. Yeah. I think, uh, to be honest, I think uh, that why they are pushing for the staking right now, um, right. the narrative around it, it's exactly about that. Yeah. Uh, probably, the you know, that the link holders is quite a big community, a very okay. um, a strong one as well. And they probably, some of them, there's some sentiment of disappointment with the performance of the link token over the last year, a couple of years. Um, because because of the bear market, of course, and and they want to release something new, and they and obviously uh, proof of stake is something very interesting and something that many uh, newcomers to crypto are getting interested on with the with the merch and a lot of interesting stuff, 
and they want to somehow um, leverage that and build the idea that Chainlink is somehow proof of stake or that there's a staking mechanism in place for creating an opportunity for token holders to have some additional income or whatever. And, uh, and I, I bet they are confident that that will somehow revive the interest of the public on the on the token. And that's that's yeah. what I think it's the main point right now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I mean, it's it's safe to say, like, is there anything else? I guess novel or interesting about the EPUSD price week or or any of these price weeks? You know, like right now, because it seems like if I can just summarize, like, basically, there's a multi-sig that controls who can read it and then it sets who is the signers and, and which is a decent method i guess like you know if you had a aw you would want like eight aws instances running to aggregate the signatures from various sources and then you sign them and push them to chain in a semi-efficient manner right yeah so you, the it's interesting that this i mean the the price fits uh, themselves these price price fits the like let's say the the price fits that the chain company arranges and sure. operates those are actually powered by the general mechanism for creating queries like oracle queries in in chainlink obviously and so in theory you can like create a price feed on your own and create your own list of node operators that will be able to report um, because that's like the main ethos of how Chainlink work as an oracle it's it's a contract in which you set uh you define a set of reporters and those reporters are just addresses that are allowed to write whatever into your contract state Yep. You are giving you are giving the you are giving them the the keys, let's say, to the to your contract state, and um, and 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 if if you try to build that, you can you can do it, and then um, you go and look for the node operators that will support support the kind of data sources or data points that you are interested on, and you um, introduce them yourself into your contract. So it's true that. You, you don't really need to trust telling the company to pick those operators. You can just talk to them and, and create that contract and, and so on, like handpick that. We don't like that, of course. Our approach is just the opposite. We don't like handpicking of reporters, but but rather choosing them randomly from... Well, this from is the non, that, non that, ones, right? But it's something that you can do. It's something that, that you can do in this. But I'm this is just to, to argue that um, the multi-sig the chain multi sig is not something hard coded into the protocol, but the truth to be told, I don't believe there's uh, a live price feed that is not operated by by them and that is not controlled by the multi sig because at the end of the day, uh, that's well, creating that it's quite cumbersome and it could, could break it every, at any time. And uh, if and there's there's some big benefit in having the chaining company right there looking for the health of the contract and the health of the node operators uh, reporting then and monitoring all of that. And, and you know, and you know perf perfectly just as we do that at the end of the day, when users, smart contract developers want to use a third party Oracle, they essentially want to outsource some security yeah. challenges. And what they are buying is not data, not price updates, they are buying peace of mind. Yeah. Well, I mean, there, there, there's a lot of really good things to say about this as far as like if you're a user and you can get over the fact that, you know, you're trusting a company like the, the, this is one of the harder things that we, we hit, you know, like right now, like as soon as as soon as this thing hits, you you can use this price and assume it's final because it is in this smart contract. Um, which is basically they're, they're the only Oracle besides, I guess, like Uniswap that can that can do that like as soon as the price hits it's final um which makes it really really fast which is is almost one of those things that um it's almost like an unfair competition in, in a lot of ways if you can try and compete with them we actually do the same so we don't have any dispute mechanism in place or or anything because as long as um but 
it's it's a bit of a trick because uh, all the heavy lifting regarding consensus and aggregation between the reporters or the node operators happens on our own chain and that then is bridged to, to ethereum yep. so i mean from the ethereum perspective as soon as the final data point is is um reported it's it's final you, sure. you can you can read that and there's no way back yeah, yeah. so it's really easy to use chain because if you go to uh, and use those price fits if you go to the documentation they have extremely well doc documented how to use them and also even if you are not familiar with web3 or if the first time that you are writing a smart contract they have a specific sections to explain to you oh, oh this is how it looks at a smart contract let's create your your first smart contract and then you will be able to use chaining in a really easy way so that is something that they have done incredibly well which is the the documentation and guide the users through their their price feeds. And then in the same documentation, they have the, the approach of creating your own uh, like data request. Uh, but this is something that you are supposed to do it. But every time that I have tried to do that through the premix in their documentation, I've never been able to, to create my own data request. Sure. Yeah. OK. Um, and then I guess, how do they do it on other chains? Or is this the exact same model? Do you guys know? On other chains yeah so it, on polygon or because i mean I, I guess we sort of answered that question too because like the hard part about going to other chains would be that a like if you if there was any need for the token in the system the token is only on ethereum so how would how would you pay on another yep. chain? but we have we have always argued that it's harder for them to move into new chains or to have a strong multi-chain strategy as we do uh, mainly because of that yeah not only because they are a big company and they cannot move that fast or whatever thing you can imagine uh the truth is that um there are some hard-coded dependencies on the link token and for them to be live on on those chains they need to breach the link token and that's not always possible or not easy another approach that they could take is to have a like a totally separate token that represents the the link token but that, that doesn't make sense from an ecosystem point but of i think view. that's like the future i mean as of now like like in here there, there's absolutely no need for the link token in this design <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, like I, on the other, on the other hand, I know that they have recently started creating a narrative about quite the opposite, about letting the users pay for their services using their their native uh, coin, like the native coin of of the chain they're running on, uh, which is something that. No, like, I mean, for, for us, it was always like that, and we, and we were always um, sure that that was the right approach because, you know, if you're talking to the Avalanche guys, um, Ether for them probably means nothing, and and uh, their own token is sound money for them. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you could, like, that. that's like I thought about, like, how you could fix Chainlink really, really quickly, and it would be <laughs> like, you just, like, get rid of the multi-sig upgradability, you have the node signers have to stake $10 million worth of link each and then <laughs> have some sort of slashing. And then, yeah, and then you just make, instead of payments, you you make link a fee token to where these people can all pay in their native tokens. And then you just, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then like the system sort of works. Like, or then, then it would, then you would at least be like talking about the nuances like you do with uh, all the other systems. You know. Yeah, still you need like some mechanism for the slashing because you cannot right. like um, off-chain aggregation is totally incompatible with sla with on-chain slashing. Uh, there are some, and this is something funny because when you look at their documentation and all their marketing and everything, they propose a lot of stuff. They're very strong in um, research. They spend a lot on research and for for expanding the Oracle ecosystem, but also in general smart contracts and what's possible with them. That's super good. Uh, but sometimes they're a bit superficial, and and for people like us that work on on very similar things, uh, we realize that there are missing details 
or you know they they say oh, we are going to implement the staking in this way or this other way and maybe people will buy it but for us it's, it's like okay but we have been there and we know what happens if you do that you know you know we know some issues that will arise if you do that how do you how will you solve it and you never find like the right person to talk about that and so there's a lot of stuff that that we don't know if they have figured out and we just need to wait to see the implementation to understand and and to learn how they solve that or they didn't solve it and they're just uh, buying some time so we don't we cannot really know we cannot really know and that's one of one of the things if you have off-chain aggregation how do you do it's like like immediately a little bit more how, or how do you handle yeah. if you are i don't know how do you handle because they also talk many times about reputation which is one concept that is pretty much developed in the in the witness oracle there's there's a lot of stuff regarding reputation on our side so when they talk about reputation there's a lot of stuff that they don't explain in detail and it's hard to understand what they really mean because they are very superficial about it so like if you want to explain it quick like why can't you do slashing and off-chain aggregation so off-chain aggregation it's it's in, in itself it's not an easy thing uh, because, okay, in its simplest form, of course, you use some kind of um, signature mechanism that uh, allows some homomorphic operations and blah, 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 blah. Like take, for example, BL BLS. Uh, and the idea is that you, uh, you can have these node operators produce signatures of some message, which will be the, the uh, price feed that date, like the latest price. And then you can take their signatures, with, which you have collected off chain through some messaging protocol, whatever, and you can take all those signatures and combine them into a single one. And as long as uh, the smart contract knows the, the the public keys, the identities of those those node operators, uh, you can prove that that combined signature, which is like very compact, is, even if there are a hundred, a million node operators, you can have a fixed size um aggregated signature and you prove that to the to the contract and we, it will perform uh so some mathematical operations uh which right now for some kind of uh, bls mechanisms they are even uh cheap to perform to perform in the evm and um and that will verify that that message has been essentially signed by those uh, node operators but um you know for certain that it has been signed by a number of those identities inside the um, node operators set, let's say, but there, there are a couple of things that are harder to prove. One is exactly which ones uh, were, um, were the signers, but that's rather easy to overcome but but the biggest challenge is how how does the smart contract know that there were not additional signers that the transmitters censored right that's an issue there you don't know if there were additional signatures and the transmitters just didn't know about those signers or they intentionally uh, re removed those signatures and, and well, there's, this no, is, there's uh, no way around that. Well, I, I know they, they talk a big game about their VRF as well. Um, and this is sort of a similar problem with that as well, too, right? Um, as far as who, who pushes it to chain, like you don't have to actually push it to chain, right? In the, in the case of the VRF, this is this is no problem because the um, in the way that their VRF is modeled, there's one single operator, which is them, and that's it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, but they could, I, I guess, in the same way, they could refuse to transmit. Would be like there, there exactly, would be exactly, exactly. From a, from a trust per perspective and randomness quality perspective, uh, their VRF is just fine. It's perfect. Sure. That has this huge uh, issue about availability. Yeah. At any time, um, the, the software that is providing the VRF outputs could just go down or it could be um, target of a denial of service attack or they could refuse to censor or 
like they, they could choose to censor or to refuse to serve some particular customer, or they could even be legally forced to refuse queries from some in from some customer. Yeah. Right. And, and that would be the problem too. Like, you know, like we had looked into using their model too, but as soon as you push it out to being allowed to be multiple operators, then you run into other problems. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Super cool. Um, all right. Anything else we can sort of go over uh, for chain link? You know, this was, we, we talked a little bit, I, I think overall they're relatively they are stable, you know, like I think it was, we had Edmund Edgar from reality.eth on there. And he, he was talking about them a little bit. And he's like, to be honest, I got to give him credits. I, I thought there would be way more downtime. <laughs> like they're actually doing okay. Um, yeah. Which is, I, I guess, to their credit, but it's a relatively centralized service still. Um, take it or leave it. And then um, what would be, I guess, if, if there is a user and, and they wanted to use Chainlink, what would be some of the, better ways to do it? Like how, how could a user use Chainlink and do this in a way that that is follows some sort of best practice for an Oracle? Because <laughs> I mean, like the, the good thing about Chainlink that, that you have to, like everybody has to admit, like using an ETS dollar price feed from Chainlink is great because for the most part, it's completely free and everybody's updating it for you. You know, like same with a lot of their price feeds, like if you're short on cash, it's it's probably the best way to get some some things up there. Um, and, and same with like most people don't seem to question. So if you were like, I want to use it because I'm broke, what can I do um, to do to do this in a safe way? Anything? Yeah, that that's a tough one because if uh, without that cons constraint, like I was thinking. Okay, uh, if you have a contract, you want to use Chainlink, but do, you don't want to be exposed uh, to their to the multisig, for example. So you do the other thing. You handpick the operators. You set that into your contract and provide methods for your own governance model, let's say, um, module uh, to, to, Does anybody update, do to update the operators. And I, I don't I don't really know. For example, that's not the case of Aave. That they they could perfectly have like that model in which they pick the operators and if some if they and they can promote or demote some operators to add and remove if they don't trust them anymore that that should be sort of right because if the if that protocol or that default product whatever they already have um, um, a governance mechanism in place and they are updating contracts using that mechanism or whatever, it should be perfectly fine for them to update the uh, reporters like that. The thing is that if they are using the price feeds, like free riding the price feeds because you are broke, whatever, uh, you cannot do that. You uh, it, it will be chaining the company, the multisig, who decides who is their reporter for each of those uh, price feeds. But the the other for the other model, I think it should be fine because it doesn't create reliance on on other on third parties governance. Let's say it's contained within your own governance, and it's even even it's not that that uh, different from and some from recommendations that we give to our users on how to update data sources inside uh, an Oracle query. In our case, it's it's sure. sort of similar. Well, I mean, how do you feel like, I, I think, I, I think it might be like an Aave or a compound model, like some, some people figure which one, but they would use like the chain link price feed and then fall back to a Uniswap price feed or use the chain link or, or like a liquidity, you know, uses a chain link price feed and then falls back to its seller. Like, do you think that that helps in any way or, or is it, you know, or, or there's just, does, does it add different risks? Uh, in my opinion, it's a really wise decision to use uh, two oracles or use a fallback oracle because uh, a wise decision to use chaining for me would be something similar to when you are using any other oracle. It's you should take into account that an oracle could fail, and a lot of people that is using chaining right now could think that chaining is impossible to fail. But it's something that it's not true because even they have uh, in the, their documentation, they have an, a section where they explain, okay, you shouldn't be consuming uh, 
a price feed that is updated more than three or four hours. I don't remember, but everybody read about that when the Terra Luna happened. So it's really important that you have a defensive, de defensive mindset when you are consuming an Oracle, even chaining. And if you have for that defensive mindset, you have a full bar Oracle, it's a, a really good option. Cool. Um... Yeah, I mean, that's what we, we usually just tell people, like, if you want to use Chainlink, that's fine. Try and add in some sort of protection, some that's sort of check on the data, and, and you'll be good. So anyway, uh, any last words we can, we can add before we log off? I think this was this was super, super useful, I think, for a lot of people. Hopefully, people could learn a little bit about Chainlink. So. Uh, yeah, I, we, I, I wish we could explain more things, but um, as Tomas mentioned, uh, it's not always easy to understand what they are doing um, and because there's a huge gap between what they have ex explained, explained, proposed, documented, and then implemented. And sometimes it can be a bit uh, obscure, but we would really love to understand better um, what they're doing and also their decisions and to learn from, from their cool. rights and their wrongs. Yeah. Well, well, thanks guys so much for being here. For, for the viewers, I'll post. Um, so I'll post this smart contract. So you, you, it's actually all verified on Etherscan, which is good for them. Um, and then you can you can go look and make sure that we're. I think everything here sort of jives with how how it actually functions in real life currently. And yeah, so hopefully we can get one of them on here, and, and they can explain it further with some plans. So uh, thank you guys very much. Soon. Thank you. Thank you.